the good pleasure of having Michael Fogelberg with me. Michael uh, uh, is uh, one of the, the founders of the Boston chapter of uh, Extinction Rebellion, but you also started working in housing. Is yeah, that right? Those are my early days. Yep. Yeah. What yep. did you do then? Uh, well, I worked in Lowell, Mass, uh, starting uh -huh. in 1985, yeah. uh, saving a low and moderate income housing development up there, like 267 units. Uh, and I came down and I worked for the Mass Tenants Organization. The, there, uh, there's a lot of immigrant uh, population in Lowell. Correct. You, you yep. worked with them? Or That's or? right. Yeah, it was uh, people from Central and Central America, uh, the Caribbean, yeah, and um, uh, a lot of folks from Puerto Rico, yeah, Dominican Republic, a uh, real mix. It was a real, real mix. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. It was. Uh, you made headway, right? Oh yeah, we saved it. Yeah, my last yeah. day there, a judge ordered the deed be transferred from the delinquent property owner back to the H Department of Housing and Urban Development. Yes, yes. And then they, they took it over and revitalized it. It's a beautiful community. So uh, tell me this. Um, uh, when did you start getting interested? When did you first learn that we have a climate problem? Well, you know, I remember like long ago, like when I was a little kid, actually, there, there was, every once in a while there'd be a news report about the greenhouse effect. Yeah. You know, like on the news or yeah. something like that. And then, uh, you know, I was definitely an environmentalist growing up, a camper, and loved outdoors. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And then... Uh, where, where, where did you grow up? Oh, I grew up in Minnesota. Yeah. And then I moved out here in 85, uh -huh. 1985. So I've been in Boston for a long time. Yeah. But, um, yeah, and, you know, and then it just started, you know, perking up in the, in the journals and the newspapers and the TV and, you know... Um, it, it just has become a growing concern of mine, and I finally had time to devote myself just to climate work. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. But I've been concerned about it, highly concerned about it, for and well over 10 years. What was uh, your entry into climate activism? Well, I, I did work for the League of Conservation Voters for a long time around general environmental um, issues. But... Uh, I think the thing that really triggered it for me was hearing about the first actions that Extinction Rebellion did in mm -hmm. London. Mm -hmm. And I was just really excited that um, somebody was doing civil disobedience. And then um, I actually know Ken Ward, who was one of the early folks here in the United States, who did direct action on um, uh, gas lines out in the Midwest. Right. And one of the early people to be arrested turning off uh, a big um, junction for the gas lines. Right. Um, this, so, was, this was before Line 3, right? Yeah, uh, before they, Line yeah. 3, right. right, yeah. So um, so you heard about Extinction Rebellion in, uh, in the UK. Yeah. You give us a little bit of um, history of Extinction Rebellion. It's a, a relatively new group. It right? is, it is. Yeah. yeah, and it's all volunteer. I, I mean, I guess there's some staff now. I mean, well, there's certainly staff in the US. There's some staff in the UK. Um, they were largely volunteer initially, and they just wanted to do civil disobedience. And they just wanted to draw people's attention to the climate crisis and the urgency of the emergency. Yeah. Um, and that's what really galvanized me. I'd done civil disobedience and direct action previously um, over the years around housing right. and um, other issues. So I was pretty comfortable and saw that as, a, as something I could really enjoy, actually. This is something you risk mm -hmm. being arrested for. Right. Yep. You, you block the street. Yeah, we so, block the street, or you, you sit in in an office, or, you, you know, whatever. Um, and then uh, you, f you helped form this uh, Boston chapter uh, of uh, Extinction Rebellion. Yeah, I think I was, like, one of the first ten people. There, were, there was a trickle, yeah. you know, that started, and then I responded to an email or on a website, Replied once I saw the action in England, I looked locally. I see, I and see. And then uh, found a website, and then got connected to a couple people here that were the the very first people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then I was actively involved with Extinction Rebellion for at least oh at least three years. Yeah. Um, and uh, mostly doing media work and um, helping with. Um, deciding what kind of actions to do. That's right, kind of right, right. So uh, Extinction Rebellion, they had a very big action in London. They mm -hmm. basically closed down the city. Right, 
Right. Um, yep. And they had something uh, like 100,000 people closing yeah. down the yeah. city. Yeah, lots and, and lots, yeah. And they had a particular... They had a particular demand, mm -hmm. which was to cr to call for an, a climate emergency, mm -hmm. the and they mm -hmm. did. The mm -hmm. government eventually did. Yep. So it was very successful right. in that. Right. Absolutely. What success has Extinction Rebellion had in the United States? In the United States, well, I think it's raised the profile of the climate issue absolutely, and driven the sense of urgency forward. Um, I think what's interesting about the U.S. is that there's a range of activist groups that are pushing the system from different places. You know, Extinction Rebellion is out on the streets, it doesn't want to be involved in politics or legislation. You know, then there's the Sunrise Movement, which is actively engaged in legislative work as well as doing civil disobedience mm -hmm. and bringing young people into the movement. And then there's like the 350.orgs and the, you know, um, that are yeah. doing other kinds of activism yeah. as well. So. And, and raising it in the political arena. And yeah. Extinction Rebellion doesn't do that. It's mostly about being on the street, reaching yeah, people. But you were also involved in 350.org, right? Well, I participated yeah. in a number of actions, right? Yeah. They targeted a couple of the banks. Uh, they went after Chase. I, I don't know if they're still going after Chase, but I participated in a couple of those actions, just as a supporter participant. Uh -huh. and, uh, so you must have seen, in all these days of activism, you must have seen a change in how in public perception and media coverage of, of the climate issue. Well, one of, one of the first actions that XR took after I started was to do an occupation of the Boston Globe. Um, and that was, that was really huge. I was a little skittish at first about that, but people felt like the Globe was just, just was not reporting with the urgency required. And so we went into, uh, we, you know, like 350 of us, 400 of us, went into the first floor of the Boston Globe building, held a rally in the building, and um, ultimately, you know, their coverage began to evolve. And, um, you know, David Abel is one of the lead people, and they have another reporter on it, um, so that the climate is getting the kind of coverage it deserves, and we're really pleased with that. I think that's one of our biggest accomplishments. Biggest to success, this point. successes, yeah. yeah. I, I noticed um, uh, that they, they're have an article on the climate just about every day now, mm -hmm. just uh, something. Uh, uh, and um, uh, also, I noticed that there was there was a, an activity in um, an action in uh, downtown Boston where they closed down uh, Tremont Street, mm -hmm. and uh, there were There's a lot a of media. In. There were a lot yep. of there were at least three or four uh, TV crews yep. out there. Yep. Uh, so I think it's uh, being covered a lot more. Mm -hmm. And you credit ac activism for that. Well, I think civil disobedience is is it's going the extra mile to put your not, not your life, but your you know your body on the line. You're you're making a, a statement, unlike you know writing letters or or beyond yeah. voting. I mean, there are lots of different ways to participate. Yeah. But when you do civil dis disobedience and you risk arrest, um, you know it's 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 a bigger statement. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that people are willing to do that more and more, I think, is good news for climate action. So this is a report from the climate crisis. I have the good pleasure of having uh, Michael Fogelberg with, with me, and he's been a longtime activist in, in climate issues, and so it's really, really good to be with you. Thank you. So, um, Michael, uh, tell me of this. Um, you inconvenience a whole lot of people. Mm -hmm. When we close mm -hmm. down the street, mm -hmm. when you do some kind of mm -hmm. activism. Yeah. And they're yeah. not responsible. Yeah. They're not responsible for spewing out greenhouse mm -hmm, gases. Mm -hmm. How do you justify that? Well, I think, I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of street blocking myself, but I think, I think it is kind of a wake up call. I mean, because part of, part of what we're trying to do is just get people thinking about the problem, get people to understand that, that it's serious and, you know, blocking traffic can make the point and, uh, often aggravate folks, but um, there's usually ways around the group, you know, uh, other roads to take yes. to get where you want to go. Um, you know, and I think when you block the street, the target is the general public, that you want people to wake up to the circumstances to understand the emergency. Um, you know, other targets are the banks, the big investment groups, XR and 350 have targeted those. 
um, other In, insurance companies, insurance as well. companies, yeah. the finance sector. If yeah. we move the money, you know, we can change the world. Right. Um, so I tend to favor um, actions that target groups like that. Um, you know, if say, you know, you could chain the doors to the State Street Bank building, and you know, chain yourself to the chains and uh -huh. lock the doors. You know, that to me. That's it. I prefer actions like that more so, right? Because right. State Street is making money on oil, funding new projects, you know, to burn more yeah. coal, oil, and gas. And uh, but um, you know, people in, in the group. I mean, it's a volunteer group. People will do what they feel like doing, and you know, people have different different uh, priorities or different. Yeah, make different choices. But and, uh, uh, there's something so. I've noticed about uh, Extinction Rebellion. Having lived in England, uh -huh. where it started, yeah. it's very well organized. Mm -hmm. Like the mm -hmm. English, <laughs> it really yeah. is, is very well organized. Oh, yeah. in, and uh, they have committees and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's a volunteer mm -hmm. organization, but it's, it's uh, very well organized. Yeah. Well, well, it is, and it is worldwide. I mean, if you go to the website, it, it, people are, you know, holding up the symbol everywhere um they're doing whatever they can do all over the world i mean it really did spread like wildfire fire. yeah i want to give a shout out to extinction rebellion italy oh yeah <laughs> yes they're very active right. there but yeah as you say they're all over the world yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, uh what's your um preferred mode of going forward what would you like to do now to, that uh to change to change the world well <laughs> I think, well, I, wa I want to see it grow. I want to see, and I want to see creativity be brought into the movement. And XR is actually really good at that. They have art projects. They do a lot with um, the um, uh, with the the folks in red that dress up. Uh, the, the Red Rebels. The Red Rebels, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. very interesting. Yeah. You know, it's a little edgy. Doesn't necessarily reach everybody, but it's it's very powerful when you experience their presence at, a, yeah. at an event um, and I think uh, it just needs to spread and we need to find ways to bring more people into that community and I, I guess one of the benefits of being part of that community is that you're doing something about a crisis you're taking action right um, and you know you might not be ready to do civil disobedience but you might be ready to do the do some of the art projects yeah. or do support work or or something, or just participate in different ways. Um, I think we have to grow, and I think uh, we have to be multifaceted. Mm -hmm. You know, we cannot just do one thing, but I think civil disobedience, more than anything, will drive greater action. Right, right. So, uh, in, in the climate movement, um, I've noticed, uh, and I think a lot of people have noticed, that it's... Uh, it's not racially d diverse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, do you do you think that's a, that's an issue there? Well, I think um, I think people pick their places to be involved. You know, mm -hmm. and um, there are a lot of environmental groups that are made up of people of color, Hispanic people, uh, immigrants. You know, um, those communities have very extreme and serious environmental concerns because they're often yeah. on the front lines of the hardships and the harms that come from our toxic uh, our world. Um, so, and, and also white people, you know, if white people get arrested, it's a slightly different consequence that, than if you're a person of color. Right. You know? Yes. Um, I mean, Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement of old, you know, that, that was a very exceptional uh, set of events and a movement that was just incredible. But they were as a people, we're coming out of just horrific conditions. Right. And today, you know, things still aren't great, but um, I think motivations, you know, people need to find their motivation and find their place to yeah. fit into the movement. And mm -hmm. it's happening all, all over the country. Um, it just isn't necessarily within XR. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what do you think uh, going forward um, is the best tactic to um, have fewer power stations that are fossil fuel driven, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, fewer, more solar, more wind. What, yeah. what's, what, are, what are some of the options that we can have? Well, in my, in my view now, the goal is to uh, 
produce more clean renewable energy, right? I think the more that's available, the more it will naturally displace the old dirty fuels. Um, I think the efforts to ban gas hookups in some of the cities is an important step. Um, as a housing activist, I worry a little bit about um, that limiting, you know, the production of housing, uh, which we need. But um, but still, I think it's it's an important step, and that calls for substitution. Like, what are you going to? You got to use something instead of that. What are you going to use? How are you going to how are you going to run these places? How are you going to power them? So, um, and then we got to keep pushing against the fossil fuel industry and their political power. You yeah. know, I think that's I think that's critical. Yeah. So one of the things I've noticed is that um, the uh, conservatives now are kind of quiet about the about the climate crisis. Mm, mm -hmm. They used to be vociferously against this, saying yeah. it's a hoax and all this. Yeah. Now they're kind of quiet about it. But it really bothered me that the uh, climate bill that got passed yeah. recently, the the um, what's it called? The, the Inflation, the reduction, inflation Act. reduction Act. Yeah. It's the greatest, yeah. greatest PR yeah. move, yeah. I think. Yeah, um, it is great. That no Republican voted for There were 50 yeah. people who stunning. voted against that. Yeah. Yeah. How are you going to get over that, you know? It's pretty stunning. Yeah. It really is. I, I mean, can you reach Republicans? Can you, um, can you well, reach a... Cons uh, I mean, we're in a liberal state. Place. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what about... What well, I mean, I think there's, there's elected officials and then there's people you know, Republican people and people that vote Democrat or Republican or don't vote at all. And then there's, you know, then there's the primary voters who are in the Republican Party right now are pretty insane. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, unfortunately, I think the only thing that may move some of them are the extreme environmental crises that yeah. we're experiencing. You know, yeah. the flooding that just hit Kentucky, the flooding that hit St. Louis, uh, um, the fires uh, Texas, out west, Texas, the yes. Texas, you know, Dallas just was inundated yeah. with rain. Uh -huh. um, you know, I think uh, I think those events are slowly going to push people to think. Well, maybe you know, maybe we should be doing something right. about this. And then, as long as we're leading, you know, towards the solutions, you know, and open and welcoming of people who are coming into the movement or just understanding. What the, we're confronting as a society, you know, I, I think that's that's hopeful. I think mm. that bodes well. I mean, we still have to survive these crises, yeah. you know, yeah. which are growing. But. Yeah, yeah. So this is reports from the climate crisis, and I'm having the pleasure of talking with uh, Michael Fogelberg, uh, who is one of the founders of of the. Uh, one uh, uh, Extinction Rebellion, one of the f uh, most active, early members, yeah, early yeah, member, yeah, uh, early yeah, member yeah. of that of that in in the uh, Boston area, mm -hmm. and uh, when you brought it to America, it was. Uh, uh, it was. It's really about civil disobedience, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, yep. uh, as opposed to writing writing senators. Yeah, I think um, you know when you talk about changing the the basis of energy for a society, you know, you're talking about some of the most entrenched, powerful corporations, interests, people in the world, right, or in the whole country, and um, you know, voting needs to happen, but it's it's just not going to be the only thing that really moves people off a dime to say no. I mean, the energy companies knew in the 70s uh, that their burning of oil and coal and so-called natural gas was warming the climate. They knew. Their own scientists knew. They had yeah. people working for their own companies that were telling them, okay, there's a problem. Let's start developing these other you know, yeah. solar, etc. And, you know, those folks got booted. Uh, mm -hmm. The oil, the oil guys wanted to be oil guys, and, and that was it. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, even now, they're planning more wells, right. more exploration. I mean, they're really clueless um, and self-interested. And, you know, maybe some of them think there's an end game, you know, and they figure, you know, all is lost, and, you know, we got to have oil with our little you know, are in our little bubble and we'll survive as long as we can. You know, who knows what they think? But it's, it, it really is 
Well, astounding. There, there was an article uh, uh, several years ago in the yeah. New York Times, a very uh, in-depth article about what happened, and it was uh, during the Reagan administration. Mm -hmm. The Actually, the oil companies were kind of interested in changing, mm -hmm. and the, the uh, government officials during that administration says, oh, no, you don't have to do anything. Oh, and well. so they, 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 um, they kind of... Uh, went along with that, hmm. of course, for their mm -hmm. own self-interest. And, yeah. and so I think yeah. it was a cooperation between the government and, and big in yeah. industry. Well, and, and then Al Gore, you know, got close, you know, when he was a senator, he really pushed it pretty well. And that was when um, George Bush II was president, I think. Or was it George Bush one? I'm forgetting. Anyway, but John Sununa, the former governor from New Hampshire, was one of his advisors. Right. And again, according to news reporting, it was actually um, Sununu who put the kibosh on really? plans for, uh, for for its transition to renewable energy and efficient right, out of right. fossil fuels. Yeah. Well, so. it kind of bothers me because uh, a lot of these people seem kind of like they were bribed. You know, they were mm -hmm. given campaign donations, and that seemed kind of like uh, mm -hmm. um, unfair. That you yeah. get it's a bribe. It's not uh, mm -hmm. called campaign donations. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. But I, I I'll, I'll read another article, Michael. I read uh, an article recently that we know about the fires in California, yeah. right? Yeah. But they, um, there's a, the article said that there's a bigger problem of floods coming. Well, and after, well, after a drought, yeah. floods are much more devastating. The mega flood. Yeah, yeah the mega drought, the mega flood. Yeah, yeah. I, saw, I saw that piece too. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah. Well, there are those crazy, um, I forget what they call them, like... Weather streams, like these concentrated, um, intense, you know, streams of weather. Right. Whether it, like Buffalo got hit with that, with snow, with a snow, crazy oh. snowstorm years ago. Yes, I remember. Right, and it was yes. in just this narrow little belt along, uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. was it, the lake there. And then they're talking about a similar sort of event happening from the Pacific over into California and just dumping, like, a storm's lasting weeks. Yes. And dumping just right. rain like you would not believe. Yeah. Foot and feet of rain into the valley there, which, uh, yeah, would drown out a lot of farms, a lot of food. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably the food is one of the things that worries me the most. Yeah, so that's, um, we're just talking really about the, uh, the United States. Mm -hmm. And... Um, the world is really uh, suffering as mm -hmm. well. There was mm -hmm. there's tremendous drought that there hasn't ever been in Europe. In Europe, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and all the rivers are dry. The the Rhine, mm -hmm. the Po in Italy, yeah. um, it, uh, England is dry. England, could you imagine England being no, dry? You no, know, not at all. and um, and then before that there was this uh, this great heat in uh, India, Pakistan, mm -hmm. and the one mm -hmm. thing we know. Uh, about the future is that it's going to get worse. Yeah, right. And exactly. what are the people going to do? Yeah. They're going to leave. I know. Why? Right, right. They're going to move. They They're are. going to move. There'll be internal migration in our country, you know, and then there'll be migration from other countries into ours. And, you know, probably Americans will try and flee into Canada, you know, and... And then, yeah, people from Africa will maybe try to move into Europe, other places. Europeans will move into other... Yeah, it's going to be nutty. Uh -huh. It's going to be nutty. Yeah. But, uh, and that's why I think being involved in a movement that's addressing the problem... You know, when, you, when you're in a movement like that, you don't have to dwell on the difficulties or the hardship that's coming. You have to understand it. But it's the community that you build with your activism that's really sustaining. Yeah. And it's, it's, cause you really, I mean, I mean, I'm not a religious person, but it, there is a spiritual element to it. Yes. The, the community that you build and the hope that you share and the, uh, and the dedication to saving people's lives, you right. know, and preserving right. some semblance of society, you yeah. know, um, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. one of the things I've noticed when you were saying that is that in uh, in these demonstrations or actions, mm -hmm. um, people are dancing and having fun. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. not a dower. No. It's not, not a dower all. thing. No. And that's um, th that's uh, intended. Yeah. Right. Yeah. To bring pe yeah. pe people want to come totally. and have a good time totally. as well as yeah. test the thing. Yeah. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. I'm not. 
I'm not really a fan of uh, Diane's either that oh, much. Oh, God, they're, they're terrible. I, I'm sorry, I haven't been to Diane's. <laughs> And what you do? I've done them too. I yeah, them yes, too, you have to. You have to lay on the on the ground and either the ground is either dead. cold or hot. Yeah, and it's yeah, dirty. And, yeah. and yes, yes, it's yes. just so passive. I just don't like it being so passive. Yeah. And um, whatever. So I, yeah, I pres- pre- prefer to be more engaged, more active. Closing, closing or the, the intersection and dancing yeah, with it. But, and, you and know, so on. people are going to do what they want to do, and as long as people keep doing stuff. You know, the issue keeps getting pushed to the uh, to the front pages and into the news. Oh, and let me say one thing. The, what I would like to see more of is a focus on our weather reporters. Uh, you know, there was a really good guy named Chris Gloninger, and he was on Channel 10, yeah. NBC 10, um, and he did this great reporting on his own time, mm-hmm. these little climate reports right. that they broadcast. And, well, unfortunately, his contract isn't renewed. He's in Iowa now. And... You know, they're doing a few things, but boy, they're the ones that could really communicate the issue mm. to a local audience. Right, you know, right. people love the weather people, yeah. the weather reporters, and they don't do anything about right. climate, you know? Um, so I'd like to see more attention focused on them and what their obligation is to their communities to inform people about, yeah. you know, where we are on the climate track. So in our, in our last 30 seconds here, um, where are you personally uh, going forward what is what's your plans right well I, I i try to help somebody get elected to boston city council recently um you know i'm looking at taking some other tack on climate yeah um you know but that is my primary focus my yeah. primary focus all right, this is uh, reports from the climate crisis. We're here every every other week, and we're talking about what's what's going on in the world and what's going on in our uh, country.